All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm fired up, and that joke will make a lot more sense here in a minute. <laughs> That's hot. Okay, um, yeah, so um, we're going to, I should have put on a warm-up suit for this one, because one reason it's hard to write copy when you start out is you've got so much in front of you and it can seem overwhelming. And not only that, but you get just in the groove for writing one part of the letter and then you have to shift gears. And that's because different sections you're writing have different rhythms, different feels. For example, a story needs to have a good momentum to it, but it's not nearly as fast paced as good closing copy is. So today let's talk about some ways you can overcome the problem of, of shifting gears and it has to do with warming up to write each section. Just like if you're gonna warm up to work out or to go for a run, you can warm up to write each section of your copy differently. And this will help a lot, especially if you've got a big project and you feel like you're facing a brick wall. But I don't know of anything that can help you more than this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health and finance and business opportunity, you may wanna get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So Nathan, let's talk about Gene Schwartz's big concept of copywriting. That it is not writing, but it is in fact really assembling. Mm -hmm. He mentioned this at a talk he gave to people at Rodale many years ago. And Rodale used to be a big publisher of books, almost entirely based on direct response marketing, and they closed their door five years ago after 87 years in business. Now, when Gene Schwartz talked about assembling, he meant, he meant it's like Legos. You have a bunch of little parts and you put them all together. And when you do this, it kind of helps if you know what the finished product's gonna look like. That is, if you know what the structure is, you have an idea of which part goes where and why it goes in that particular place. But don't worry if you don't have that sense when you start, because often the structure, in the same way as your headline and hook, the structure will reveal itself as you work through other parts of the copy. So today we're gonna to talk about six parts, the six parts that you assemble. There are more, but these, these will be good for warming up. And we'll talk about them in the order that they usually appear in the sales letter. Now they usually appear in the sales letter in the same order. They'll have a headline first and a closing copy and a PS at, at the end. But the, the parts we're going to cover, you may not want to do them in that order. And I'll give you some reasons why as we get more into each one of them. We're going to cover six key parts of copy, and we'll talk about how and why to warm up for each one when you're writing. They are headline, lead, bullets, story, closing copy, and testimonials. Now, the reason you want to warm up, again, is the same reason you'd want to warm up when you're working out, to loosen your muscles, in this case, your mental muscles, and to get the momentum of flow going. So, number one, headline. Let's start talking about headlines and how warming up for them can help. Headlines are not like normal speech, or even like most of other copy. They're attention getters, concise, energetic. They're drama queens, emotion packed, yet believable, sometimes a little unusual. And they have a rhythm and a feeling all of their own. So warming up is often as much as getting into a different frame of mind as it is loosening up and developing momentum. And here's a handful of ways to write to warm up when you're gonna write headlines. One could be reading copy, reading headlines, reading headlines out loud, 
Another could be hand copying headlines. There's a whole thread of people on Twitter who think hand copying is silly, but I don't. Um, and be careful not to swipe word for word um, when you're hand copying. There could be big trouble for you if you do. But an even better way to warm up is looking at winning headlines and instead of copying the headline, write a variation of them. Follow the structure, but change the words. Another way to warm up is to think about and write down best case scenarios after your product is used and a positive change occurs and write down what comes to mind. Another way of thinking about the worst case scenario before using your product. What's the pain like? What's the problem like? And write down what comes to mind or just brainstorming in general. One thing to keep in mind is maybe headlines are not the piece of copy to work on first. Um, and here is why. Sometimes your best headline idea will come after you've been working on other things like bullets and stories. Sometimes it comes when you're in flow, in motion, doing other things. If it's a struggle to come up with a headline, put it off until later and work on other parts of the letter first. Any thoughts? I got two things to add. Number one, a lot of my best headlines have come from when I was writing bullets. And so I wholeheartedly agree with that. And number two, one of my favorite copywriters actually wrote this book. It's called Advertising Headlines That Make You Rich. And it is an amazing book for swiping headlines. Yes. Um, I know that guy because he's me. So there, <laughs> there, there, there's a good idea. And it actually shows you how to swipe without plagiarizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number two is the lead. And how do we warm up for the lead? Why should we warm up for the lead? Well, the lead is so vitally important. Some people call it the lead the, the first sentence, at, and some people call it first few paragraphs. Um, I think both are true, depending on the length of what you're doing. But I'm going to focus on one sentence for this warm-up exercise idea. Back to Gene Schwartz, he said, and I paraphrase, the headline's job is to get the prospect to read the first sentence, which is the lead. After the first sent, and the first sentence's job is to get the prospect to read the next sentence. So again, the first sentence he's talking about, of course, is the lead. After the headline, it's the most important copy in your script or your letter or your email or your ad. Now, Maybe it's not the most important in terms of making the sale as your offer and closing copy are, but it's definitely the most important as a gateway because if it doesn't propel the prospect into reading the next sentence, your chance of making a sale has precipitously declined to zero. Nada. Niente. Therefore, you'll be better off writing your lead when you're warmed up than when you're not. So how do you warm up? I got three ideas for you. One, read the leads of other winning sales letters for inspiration, not plagiarization. Two, start reading through your research and especially your bullet points if you've already written them. And it's a good idea to write them first, as Nathan was just talking about and as we'll talk about. As ridiculous as it feels to do that the first time you do that, it'll feel a lot more right after the first time. Three, talk to someone on the phone or in person about your product. Sometimes the right words just pop out in conversation. Be aware of what you're saying and stop to write it down. When you say something, here's something good you said, say something good and hear it, or you could record it. One suggestion about leads, the lead, like the headline, is one piece of copy that's worth going over more than once at different times because it's so crucial to getting your prospect to read the rest of the copy in the first place. The only thing that I have to add is, and this isn't specifically for copywriting, but it definitely has overlap. You recommended I read a store or a book called Wired for Story. And mm. the, the author in there does a whole chapter on how to grab people's attention with the first sentence of your story. And a lot of the rules in there 
totally apply to copywriting. So if you're having trouble writing copy that grabs attention right off the bat, that's a really good book to read. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for bringing that up. A Wired for Story by Lisa Crone with a C, C-R-O-N. Yeah, great. All right, um, bullets. With bullets, we're in entirely different territory. I mean, bullet points in a sales letter, not, um, you know, not the little things that go in guns. Um, and they can be really make or break for your copy. You want to warm up before you write bullets because bullets are very kinetic. They're physical. They have motion. Bullets have greater motion and emotional impact than most any other part of your copy. Not only that, they're really condensed, like a headline. They're both conversational, but they drill down to a single point, usually a single point that creates both curiosity and desire at the same time. So the reason you want to warm up for bullets is to get in that right frame of mind before you start writing. Also, bullets are often the best place to start the whole entire copy process when you're using the assembly concept of creating parts of the sales letter and then assembling all those parts into a single piece of copy. A lot of really successful copywriters start with the bullets and build outward from there. So how can you warm up for bullets? The best way to get into the world of bullets is to read them or to copy bullets, hand copy bullets from great copywriters. Um, reading them could be the way you normally read, or you could read them out loud. Really valuable to read stuff out loud. Just remember, you can borrow phrases or even better, make variations of phrases from other people's work. Maybe two or three words, not the whole bullet itself. Make sure you don't do that. Now, something else. Think about this when you're writing bullets. A-list copywriter David Deutsch told me not too long ago that he rewrites his bullets four times, each one, four times. I decided to try that on my most recent project. It definitely worked. A lot of the initial bullets were pretty good, but four times rewritten ones were a lot better. And here's why this is such a good idea and why it's so important. And a tip of the hat to David Deutsch. One bullet alone can make the sale. And here's why. Sometimes there's one feature or one benefit of your product that fits like a glove with what one individual, not the mass market, but one person is looking for. Unless you can read the mind of your prospect at the time they are reading your copy, you won't know what that one thing is. And that's why it's important to look at your product from as many different angles as you can when you're writing bullets. And to whatever degree you can, always look at it from the prospect's point of view. I know when I first started writing bullets, they were a little bit difficult for me. The guy that really helped me out with them, studying his work, was Gary Bensavanga. He does amazing work on writing bullets, and he lays it out really well. And I think he even has either a website or an, an old newsletter. I don't think he's writing anymore, but uh, he's definitely one of the greatest when it, for at least for me, when I was learning how to write bullets, he was the guy that really made it, made it uh, stick, made it drive home for me. Yeah. He's, he's terrific. He's absolutely fantastic. And he's a customer of mine. Did you know that? I did not know that. He bought my audio tape, let your clients do your selling no longer in print. Um, Gosh, 20, 30 years ago. Nice. All right, number four, story. So, God, we talk a lot about stories. There's a funny thing about stories. <laughs> a lot of people tell great stories when they're talking, but then they get all kind of stilted and boring when they just try and sit down and write a story. Why is that? Okay, I'm going to put this out there. The culprit is school. Learning to write in an uncomfortable, artificial, constrained, stressful environment. So people get trained to sit down and write stories that way. Gets conditioned, gets anchored in their nervous system. 
sometimes people get all awkward and contrained. They just carry on the same trauma into writing stories. And you would almost get the impression that I don't think school helps you too much with your writing. And you would be right. The fact is, as humans, we are natural storytellers. We are not born expert storytellers, but it is literally in our nature to tell stories. So the reason to warm up before you start writing your story then is to go from the schoolroom regimented writing mode into a more natural human storytelling mode. That way, your first draft will be a lot more compelling, conversational, and natural. So I'll suggest a few ways to warm up. One way to do it is to tell the story like you're going to write to another person, an email or a letter. Tell it out loud like you're living it or you're narrating what you're watching. Not like you're trying to be a suave storyteller. Record your voice and transcribe what you said word for word. That's for starters. Another trick is editing your first draft after the fact to leave out the boring stuff. That's what Alfred Hitchcock said as his definition of drama. Life with the dull bits cut out. But please don't worry about that until you're editing. Do that cutting out of dull bits later. What you're going for when you're creating the story is flow, momentum, to tell your story while your mind is visiting storyland. Another way to get started is not to write a story, but just do free writing in a journal or in a pad of paper or a Remarkable or an iPad um, or one of those Samsung tablets or a Microsoft thing <laughs> for a while. Write anything. That'll loosen you up. Sooner or later, the story you wanted to write will find its way out of your brain and onto a sheet of paper. And further thoughts about story. It's funny because there's so much to learn about story, and yet there's nothing to learn about story. You were born with the ability to tell stories, coded right into your DNA. Your stories don't have to be worthy of a Pulitzer Prize or an Academy Award. The basic thing to know is they need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They should primarily be about one person who has a problem that a lot of people have and a problem that you can help them solve with your product. And by the end of the story, they should have solved the problem and reaped the rewards of having solved the problem. There's always more to learn, but those are the core basics. I like to think about each piece of copy based off of what the emotional trigger that it's responsible for is so you mentioned the headline is to grab the attention the bullets are to uh, concisely state some of the benefits or some of the things that they're going to get um, the lead is to pull them in the the call to action it has its own purpose for me the story the goal or the point of the story is to draw that personal connection to make them feel mm. like you and them are on the same page and so for my stories that's usually what i'm going for yes all the editing yes all of the stuff that you mentioned but one of the final checks that I do before I say, okay, this is a good enough story is I say, does this emotionally bond me with the reader? And if it does, then it passes. And if it doesn't, I go back and I rewrite it. I've noticed that about your stories. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of your sales letters, but I've seen a lot of your Facebook posts. And sometimes you tell personal stuff and you take risks and you become vulnerable in a way that I wouldn't have the guts to do, honestly. And I'm not a totally closed person, but you really put it out there. Um, and I can see what you're talking about in action. And I'd say it works. And, um, you know, we, we all have different risk tolerances and openness tolerances and all of that. But to whatever degree you can do it, do it. Because it, it works, it makes a difference. And do it skillfully, as, as you do, Nathan. I mean, you do a good job with it. But, wow, some of that stuff just knocks me on my ass sometimes. Really good. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. It is. All right. So, next, closing copy. And closing copy is 
one kind of copy, even if some of these other things say, well, I like some of your ideas, David, I don't really need to warm up. I mean, I just wrote. Closing copy is one kind of copy I would definitely recommend that you warm up to write. That's because like other parts of your sales letter or your VSL or your ad, closing copy has a rhythm all its own. Some call it a crescendo. Oh gosh, I wish we had Dr. Doug Pugh on just for this one part. Some call it a crescendo. Some say it's staccato, like this. Rat -a -tat 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 -tat. Closing copy has an urgency and a conciseness to it, and the pace picks up, the intensity increases. It's like you've got this momentum going already, and now you need to slightly kick it up a notch to take your prospect across the finish line. So I'm going to make my suggestions on, first of all, how to do this with your beverage of choice. If you drink coffee, a double espresso is not a bad idea. You want to get a little hyped up. If you drink green tea, I'm not sure what to tell you. And you do drink green tea, don't you, Nathan? I'm drinking green tea right now, actually. Hey, okay. uh, you're on your own, man. It might be good to listen to some really fast music to get the groove of closing copy, possibly even marching music, something very rhythmic and not syncopated. Or, like with everything else, you could just read some closing copy from winning ads and sales letters. You could even read it out loud. Um, an important point from a very special previous guest. Bod Halbert was here a few weeks ago, and he said, Closing copy may be where you want to start. Not start in the finished sales letter, but start in your writing process. Um, if you've done a good job up to now, you might want to think of closing copy as a firm nudge. When I say up to now, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm switching from talking about when you start writing your copy to where it falls in the sales letter. So you've got everything else. Up to now, think of it more as a firm nudge rather than a hard push. You don't have to close that hard. You just have to be resolute and definite and confident about it. And, you know, the all the persuasion ahead of time will have done a lot of the work. What do you think? For me, closing copy is where I do most of my editing, actually, because... I find it's where I where I have the most to cut out, uh, and, and I think it's just because of that cadence. It's that I want to start hitting things at a faster rhythm towards the end because I want to keep that momentum going towards the close. And if I write from beginning to end, some of the slower writing, some of the more deliberate, intentional stuff that I'll do throughout the sales letter, I'll find myself also adding in at the end. And then you taught me if it doesn't lead to the sale, it doesn't need to be there. A lot of times when I'm at the end of my sales letter, that's where I find the most of the stuff where I'm like, that doesn't need to be there. Oh, that needs to be shortened. Oh, that needs to be taken out. And uh, just to keep that increased momentum, it kind of reminds me of like a fireworks display where you've got fireworks going off pretty rhythmatically for the first 15, 20 minutes. And then that last five minutes, it's just boom, 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 boom. Like that's the kind of feeling that I get when I flow through a good piece of copy that ends well. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's a really good point. And um, I love the fact, I love that you said that you spend more time editing it because it really is important. You know, it's one of the most, you know, paradoxical things because closing copy is very factual, very instructive and very logical, but it's also very emotional at the same time. And I mean, it's kind of like song lyrics, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. you really have to go over them and fine tune them to make them work and it can make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, let's get to our last area of possible warm up testimonials. Let's talk about the mystery of testimonials. I say mystery because apparently a lot of people don't totally get what to do and how, how to do it. 
Testimonials are interesting because they are a form of writing copy all to themselves. Of course, they need to be strongly based on what people actually told you, but it's okay to edit what they said for clarity and length as long as you get their written or emailed approval for the, um, you know, revision. What makes good testimonials especially interesting to me is they're sort of a cross between a story and a bullet point. They're like a story in that they are in simple conversational language and they usually go somewhere. They start here and something happened and some result happened. The result might be, you know, something measurable or it might be an experience or a feeling about yourself. But they're like a bullet point in that they focus on one point, one aspect, one particular benefit of your product. So you want to get in the groove to write or to edit testimonials. And how do you do that? Best way to warm up is simply to get in testimonial mode. And that would probably mean reading testimonials from other successful promotions and pro tip, read them out loud. Um, but keep this in mind. And this is where a lot of people kind of miss the mark. Uh, with testimonials, you want them to look similar, but you don't want them to look all the same, especially not like they were written or spoken by the same person. You need to vary the rhythm, the topic, and the language enough so they don't come across as all having been written by the same person. And of course, again, important, you want the person a testimonial is attributed to to give you written permission to use it. Just on that, I usually, when I'm getting testimonials from customers or clients, I ask three questions. What was the biggest problem you were dealing with? Why did you try this solution? And what was the thing that you were happiest about from this solution? And that usually gives me a good amount of material. And if I do have to do any kind of editing at all, it's usually just a tiny, tiny bit of editing. And you, like you said, just ask if it's okay. If it stays in the spirit of what they were trying to say, if it doesn't seem like you're trying to twist their words, I've never had anybody say, yeah, you can't use that edit. I want you to use what I said. I've never had that happen. Everybody's always been very happy to say, hey, that's, that says exactly what I was trying to say, but in better terms. So go with that instead. So, um, could you repeat those three questions? Yeah. What was the thing that you were struggling with? What made you try this solution? And what was the best result or the thing that you were happiest about after getting this or after using this solution? Okay. Yeah. Th those are really valuable questions. Because people suck at giving testimonials. <laughs> well, most people suck at asking for them too. I mean, people don't know how to ask them. What was the one thing you were most happy about? Right. That's the third one. Yep. On behalf of all our listeners, I'll try and do like a listener choir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> they're all very happy. Um, all right. So um, here are six. I We had some ideas about warming up for your headline, your lead, your bullets, your story, your closing copy, your testimonials. And we have a special guest next week who's going to talk about something we've never really looked square in the face. And he's going to he's going to. Um, address it with no holds barred. He's going to talk about how copywriters can get a piece of the action. He's done that himself. And this is not a piece of the action from a publisher where it's all very regimented and established in a contract. And that's good too. But not all of us have that opportunity. More people would have kind of opportunity. He's talking about he's done this and he's done it to the tune of seven, several, I don't know if it's seven, several million dollars in his pocket himself. So make sure you tune in next week. All right, David, a fantastic episode. And if you listening want to make sure that you catch next week's episode, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast on your favorite podcast feed. You can find us on YouTube and you can find us over at copywriterspodcast.com. Until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.